Okay. Uh, so the thing is that I've put up the link in the uh, WhatsApp group and a lot of you, I think, have already accessed. Uh, so please note, uh, for some reason, the way I'm sending it seems to require me to give you permission to share it. So don't get too frustrated if it's not working right at the beginning. Uh, I will get uh, an email which asks me to permit you and I will click on that the moment I see it. Okay. I normally keep checking throughout the day, but there may be some delay. So please be a little, uh, you know, patient. Uh, I'm sorry about the delay. I wish there was a way, another way of doing it, but I really don't know how. Okay. And uh, so I will keep on, um, you know, as and how I see the mails, I will try and do it. And hopefully there'll be not too much of a delay, maybe a few hours here and there. Um, I'm hoping that won't be such a big problem for all of you. All right. Uh, and I will keep, uh, you know, uploading the lectures into the same folder. So you should not have any trouble accessing the lectures which come from now on. Okay. So three of them have already gone up and I will be putting up each lecture on the day that I give the lecture. All right. Uh, and um, yeah, feel free to post your doubts or things like that to me. But again, please understand it is one teacher, a lot of you. So it may not be that I am able to answer you immediately, but I will try my best. Okay. So please just go ahead and ask me your doubts. Okay. Even on WhatsApp in class, definitely. Okay. Or whatever other means you can think of. Right. So now, uh, as is usual, I will start off with a recap of what we did last time. So let me just share my file with you. Okay. So we will not go back all the way to postulate one. Don't worry. Okay. We will start off with maybe postulate uh, five. Let me see. What is this? Uh, yeah. So maybe we'll start off somewhere here. All right. Uh, so let me just uh, start the slideshow. Uh, this is visible to everybody. I hope. Is everybody able to see this? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. So if you remember, uh, you're more than postulate five. Uh, let's let me go to what we have written below. And uh, this is something to do with the properties of a Hermitian operator. So once again, let me just remind you, um, wave functions are mathematical functions, which have information about the system, all possible information that we can imagine is there in that function, right? Uh, how do we arrive at the wave function? Well, one way to do it is by solving the Schrodinger equation. What is the Schrodinger equation? Please remember, it is something that we all believe in physics, which is it is based on the law of conservation of energy. All it says is that kinetic energy plus potential energy is equal to total energy. Okay, and you have to remember this. Okay, I mean, just, uh, I mean, at least I know as an MSc student, I was pretty scared of the Schrodinger equation. But I have realized over time that there is nothing to be scared of. And that is why I tell it to students the way I have realized is, you know, my way of remembering and adjusting to the Schrodinger equation. It is written, of course, in a fancy language, in the operator language. But nonetheless, uh, this is what it is at its heart. It is the conservation of energy. All right. Now, uh, what we have learned that the wave function has information about the physical system, but having the information is not good enough. You need to have ways and means in which you can read that information. And how do you read the information? It depends on what kind of information you need. You may want to have information about the position, which is a dynamical variable. You may want to have information about the momentum, another dynamical variable. You may want to have information about the energy. Again, another dynamical variable. You may want to have information about the potential energy. Again, another dynamical variable. Okay. So all these things you may want to have information. I mean, depending on which kind of information you want, you will do a series of mathematical operations on that mathematical function, which you're calling the wave function. So these series of operations are called as operators. Okay. And 
as i said if you want energy information you use the energy operator which also goes by the name of the hamiltonian okay if you want information about the position you will use the position operator if you want information about the momentum you will use the momentum operator and so on now these operators since they are linked with dynamical variables they also um, you know you need to be able to read that information and that's when we introduced ourselves to something special which was called the eigen value equation right and the eigen value equation what did it say that the operator operating on the wave function produces a number times that same wave function and that number we can use as a measurement now it is important that that number is real and that is why we come to this idea of hermitian operators because in hermitian operators the eigen values are always real not only that we also learned that the hermitian operators have eigen functions which form an orthonormal set and which is precisely what i have written over here one second i will try and get my spotlight which makes it a bit simpler okay so that is what i have written over here the definition of an orthonormal set which essentially tells you that these eigen functions if you pick up two distinct eigen functions then the information overlap between those two is zero there is no information overlap or in other words you say that they are orthogonal additionally if you take the same eigen function you find that the information overlap is complete is total it's one okay you have defined it as one right now in such a case you also find that if this set of eigen functions are such that you have a vector space you pick up any L wave function belonging to that vector space that means it is representing some dynamical state of the system that can be written in such an expansion that is it can be written as a linear combination of the eigen functions of that operator if you can do it this set ui is said to be complete and the operator we call it a an observable okay additionally what we learned is that this expansion is unique that is if you could write psi as an expansion like this that is it is a summation over i c i u i and you could also write psi as a summation over d i u i then you will find that for every i i going from values 1 to n whatever that n may be you will find that the c i will be equal to d i okay so this is what we learned now as usual i'm having trouble changing my slides i don't know what keeps happening over here so i will stop my share and i will restart my share okay so go yeah all right now the uh, so so this is again i have just reiterated what is an observable we will go on to the next slide and then i have written that a wave function representing any dynamical state of the system can be expressed as a linear combination of the eigen functions of wave and as i said in such a case you will call the set of eigen functions complete and you will call that particular operator an observable now when you have an observable please remember you have a, so i'm going to now this is we are kind of even recap wise covering new ground okay uh, so what we have to remember is that if a is an observable and if these uis are a set of its eigen values and we know that for every psi we can write psi like this as a linear combination of these eigen functions then if we order the ui stringently it is enough to mention just the cis to uniquely specify psi how do we know that because we know that this expansion we just proved it that it is a unique expansion what do i mean by unique that there is no two ways of doing it there is only one way of doing it okay then if you remember we said that okay in such a case we can just put in the cis without bothering about the 
functions, these UIs, because these UIs may be complicated mathematical functions. We need not bother about them. We can just order these numbers like this in a column matrix. And this itself will now represent our psi. And if you remember, as I said, this of course depends upon which observable we are using. Okay. And this is what we call as a ket. All right. So please remember, this is the way we represent it as one straight line and one. What is this? This is like a lesser, uh, sorry, uh, it is a lesser than sign, right? It's all like a lesser than sign. This is how we represent it. And um, essentially, uh, this is uh, a part of what we call as the Dirac bracket notation. Now, remember what I told you last time, we had to also define something called as the inner product. And then we realized that we needed to come up with a concept, which was essentially a vector which corresponded to every ket and that we called as the corresponding bra vector. And how did you write it down? I seem to have lost my mouse. Okay. Yeah, how did we write it down? We wrote it down like this. If you were going to write this as the ket, then the corresponding bra vector, and remember it's a one-on-one -on -one correspondence, okay? You would write it down like this. So this is a column. Sorry about that. This is a column, right? You write it down as a row, all right? And each element is replaced by its complex conjugate. Now, please remember that when you do an operation of a row vector into a column vector like this, or if you want a row matrix into a column matrix, you will end up with a number, all right? So this is a very, very important thing. You will end up with the number. Now let's go here. So these are the relations that I have written. You go from a ket vector to a bra vector. You call that operation an adjoint operation. And in terms of columns and rows, how does it uh, basically uh, translate this adjoint operation? Is that you take a column, you make it a row, replace each element by its complex conjugate. That's why you call it a transposed conjugate. I hope you remember that transposing a matrix meant to convert its columns into rows. Now remember that if you write the ket vector like this in terms of the eigenfunctions, remember that the corresponding bra vector will be written like this with the corresponding bra vector of each of the eigen kets. Okay, I'm calling them eigen kets, note you. Over here, there'll be, of course, the eigenbra, right? And each will be multiplied by the coefficient, the complex conjugate of the coefficient. So you will call this an antilinear correspondence. Why do you call it an antilinear correspondence? Because each of the coefficients is replaced by its complex conjugate over here, just like each eigenket is replaced by the corresponding eigenbra. All right. So this is the basic uh, correspondence between them. And of course, your inner product, which you were so far writing like this, two round brackets with the first wave function, comma, the second wave function, in the Dirac bracket notation, you will write it down like this. Okay. So remember the Dirac bracket notation just makes it a tighter, more compact way of writing things. Okay. Yeah. It is... Uh, not that the wave function way of writing it is wrong. No. If you are comfortable with it, please, you can go ahead and write it. There is nothing that is wrong over there. However, the Dirac bracket notation makes things more and more compact. And as you go along, you will realize that it is an easier way of writing things down. Okay. Now, also, I kind of showed you in the Dirac bracket notation how to write down what we call as the, uh, how to express completeness. And this we kind of showed was written in terms of what we called as the closure relation. And essentially the closure relation boiled down to this. Okay. So I say you had a say, uh, what do you call it? The eigenket. Oh, I have missed a summation sign over here. I'm extremely sorry. All right. This is wrong. Please, please, please ignore that. 
i'm going to stop the share and show it to you on the ice cry i'm really sorry i don't know how that happened i must have been quite tired when i wrote it down okay so the closure relation how do you write it down can you see this is this visible to everybody yes ma'am yes, ma okay good so your closure relation how do you write it down you have a summation over here i and then you have a ui ui and this is equal to the identity operator okay now please remember when you have a row vector all right multiplying so please note i may use the term matrix or vector a little interchangeably or bra or ket okay don't get confused okay they essentially mean the same thing so please note what am i doing over here this is a row matrix okay representing a bra vector this is a column matrix representing a ket vector when you multiply a row into a column like this what will you get please you will get a number correct you will get a number isn't it now i do the reverse i multiply a column all right i multiply a column with a row like this can anybody tell me what i am going to get square matrix yes i will get a square matrix very good okay i will get a square matrix which means please understand in the matrix language what is that we kind of discussed it last time a square matrix represents an operator all right so please look at it over here what do you have this is a column correct this is a row when you multiply them like that you are getting a square matrix and of course you are summing it over this i and you will end up getting the i over here the identity matrix which you know is also an operator it's the identity operator okay i hope this is clear to everybody so what is the difference between the uh just one second i'm going to stop the share all right so i hope this is clear to everybody that what is the difference between the inner product and putting things like this okay so once again let me just share the i scribe and just tell you emphasize to you what i'm really meaning over here when i do the inner product i am essentially writing something like this right this may be a psi this may be a phi and remember this will always give me a number and as i told you this number represents the information overlap between the psi and the phi right on the other hand if i wrote it like this okay you may say oh ma'am has only interchanged the positions but the meaning completely changes this will be a square matrix right and it represents an operator all right i hope this is clear to everybody okay so we we'll get used to it okay these are all new concepts i completely understand as and how we progress i'm hoping that you will get more and more comfortable with it okay so let me just go back and finish my recap it's taking a long time especially since i'm making silly mistakes so i'm really sorry about that okay where was i somewhere here perhaps yeah i'm very sorry about that i'll get that corrected okay and uh, do i have anything more okay i am done okay i was actually done with my recap fine so now we will move on to new ground all right actually not to new ground because i think we already started talking about um sorry at what was i looking for just one second let me get back to my ice cream yeah we had already started talking about various kinds of operators correct so the first operator if you remember that we talked about was essentially the identity operator right so the identity operator okay um see sometimes you may wonder you know why do we really bother about an identity operator and i would say the answer is clear say somewhere here itself okay you need to show that 
an operation like this okay is equivalent to multiplying the wave function with a one all right so that's where you need this is where you need an identity operator all right so that is why we always define an identity operator and how do you define an identity operator we represent it by an i and we say well this operating on a wave or wave on a ket will give you just the ket okay so an identity operator please remember has an eigen value of how much everything is an eigen function of the identity operator and its eigen value is always 1 all right so remember this all right it's a very uh, what do you call it um uh, it seems like a very boring kind of an operator but it is a very important operator nonetheless all right so this is an important thing to remember now let's go on to uh, more about other operators and as i told you uh, very very important is basically multiplication of operators right so multiplication of operators how did we talk about it we said well let's imagine you are operating a you are doing an operation ab and the question is what does this mean this essentially means that if you are doing ab so right now i'm not bothering to write it in terms of kets i'm just writing it as wave functions not a problem what does this mean it essentially means that you have a psi on which you operate b this will of course produce a new mathematical function or a new wave function on this you carry out the operation a what about b a psi what does this mean this means that you have a psi on which you first operate a and then whatever the result is whatever this result is on this you carry out the operation b so obviously there is a question is a b going to be the same as b a and as i told you if a b is equal to b a then you say that a and b commute and if a b is not equal to b a you say that a and b are not commuting okay and as i told you uh, that day that why are we so interested in whether operators commute or don't commute it's because we want to know whether it is possible to make simultaneous measurements and all of you realize that it is a question worth asking because once you come to the quantum regime you come into the grip of something which we call as the uncertainty principle right and you have realized uncertainty principle has been told to you perhaps even in pu right yeah and you have then heard of it of course done it in a bit more detail in bsc and we are really going to thrash it out right now all right what does uncertainty principle tell you it essentially tells you Moment that one position hello yes you want to somebody wants to ask a doubt is there a doubt to be asked i heard somebody come on all right if you have a doubt please ask okay don't hesitate so the thing is that you have realized that you know it is a possibility or rather it's it's not just a possibility it is true that you cannot measure something as simple as position and momentum of a particle in the quantum regime simultaneously and precisely right and you may ask the question is what does this have to do with commutation okay and we will we will examine this question further all right it has everything to do with commutation is what you will realize okay so now i'm going to change my page both physically and on the screen yes i've done it all right please remind me okay sometimes i may right now i didn't forget but sometimes i may just forget all right so kindly remind me if i'm doing silly things okay so uh what did we do uh in the last class if you remember we defined something which we called as a commutator right we defined something which we called as a commutator and what is this commutator essentially a commutator for a b and remember how i told you to write it you have to write it with the square brackets with a comma in between okay 
and this is written as a b minus b a so obviously if a and b commute what does commute mean that the operation ab is equivalent to the operation ba there is no difference the order does not matter then we know that this commutator ab must be equal to 0 correct if a and b do not commute okay they do not commute or in other words the order matters how you basically try to extract the information in which order you try to extract the information matters in that case you will say that a comma b is not equal to 0 or ab is not the same as ba okay this is extremely important to remember right now if you remember we were looking at certain relations with commutators and i think i had already proven the first one for you okay so the first one was that a comma b commutator is equal to minus b comma a okay yes so please 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 i think we had proved this i hope nobody has any doubts if you have any doubts please ask right away then we will move on to the other relations so to does anybody have any doubts with respect to this we did the proof last time this is where i think i stopped so if anybody has any doubts please ask okay i'm going to stop the share now and i have gone through the recap of what we did last monday anybody has any doubts please feel free to ask any doubts everybody understood that proof which i showed it was a simple one but nonetheless if you have doubts please you're most welcome to ask no doubts somebody answer yeah i'm seeing only black squares you know sometimes i wonder whether you guys are there at all or not maybe you've just put on this black box and run away has everybody understood yes ma'am yes, yes ma'am ma good 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 fine so let's now move on with the other relations okay so let me again go to my i scribe all right so what are the other relations with commutators i will maybe prove one more all right and then i will leave the rest to you so i'm going to what i will do is today on the whatsapp group i will send you a pdf which will ask you to work out certain relations okay i would like you all to try and do it and maybe submit it to me next week okay so we will have a look at how you have done it so we will try and do things on um, inner products on uh, hermitian operators linear operators and uh, we will try and do some things on commutators okay so i think there's plenty of things to just you know kind of churn your heads about and get comfortable with it remember the more you do these problems the more comfortable you will get with the ideas all right so what is the next relation the next relation is this that you have commutator of a with up with the addition of two operators and this is actually equal to a comma b commutator plus a comma c all right now let's try the next one which says that commutator of a with the product of two operators bc is essentially a comma b multiplying c is this allowed remember again that the commutator of two operators will essentially again give you a number hmm? all right and then you will have plus <coughs> b a c okay this is how it works remember order is sacred please when you are writing commutator relations 
do not change the order between the operators right look over here <clears throat> a of course is here and b c appear in this order so when you write the rhs for the first term c appears later <coughs> and here for the second term b appears first so the b and the c appear always in the same order all right i'll just have some water all right what about the next relation the next relation is this it looks complicated but it's actually a very fairly simple one to prove okay so this is b comma c all right so what is this commutator of a with the commutator of b comma c right plus commutator of b with the commutator of c comma a now remember the cyclic order of a b c is being maintained okay what do i mean by cyclic order i will just explain to you and this finally c comma a b okay is equal to 0 so what do i mean by cyclic order you have a leading to b leading to c leading to a so you can do it any which way a b c or you start with b then you have to go to c and then to a or you start with c you go to a and then b so see how that order comes about in this particular relation okay you have a b c and then you have b c a then you have c a b okay all in this particular cyclic order all right so please remember that's how you remember the last relation okay so let me do one thing i will prove for you this particular relation okay so to prove that relation what i am going to do is i am going to pick up the right hand side <clears throat> i'll pick up the right hand side okay and what does it say a comma b into c plus <clears throat> b comma sorry not b comma b into commutator of ac okay this will be so how do i write down this i will write it down as ab minus ba right be very careful <clears throat> remember commutator of ab is not the same as the commutator of ba okay then what do we have we have plus b here you have ac minus ca now let us open it out we will have essentially a b and then comes c all right and here you will get minus b a c right and here you will get b a c minus b c a right this and this are the same rather they are just neg you know opposite in sign so they will cancel each other out so what do we have now we have a into bc minus bc into a right i have just put the bracket around the bc all right so what you can see is that this is a commutation of a with bc right the orders have been changed and subtracted so you can then write it as a commutator of a comma b c if you don't like that put bc as d and then you can write this expression okay if your bc is equal to a new operator d this will be nothing but ad minus da which is nothing but the commutator between a and b then they replace d with bc and you have proved it okay so i will leave it to you to write down all these proofs by yourself okay try and do it okay please don't look up things try to do it yourself 
you will feel immense satisfaction when it works out okay they are simple relations but it is good to try and practice and do these yourselves okay there are other people of course i mean a lot of you may find this completely trivial but believe me i'm sure if all of you do it everybody will find it trivial so that's good all right so now let's look for other operators all right so the one more operator that we can think of i've changed the page i will change the physical page here is we can think of an inverse operation all right so if you have um uh, if you have an operator b okay you have an operator not b a sorry okay you have an operator a now if i hope everybody knows the meaning of this symbol here it's if there exists okay so there exists is this ulta e ulta capital e okay so if there exists an operator b such that b operating on a produces everybody i hope knows now what that operator on the rhs is that's an identity operator okay so if you have an operator a and there exists an operator b such that when you operate b on a you will get an identity operator then b is the inverse operator of a <clears throat> or you will write it b as a inverse okay so anyway this is i think not a very uh, you have all learned this kind of uh, you know terminology before so it's nothing new so b is the inverse operator of a okay this is the next operator now here comes a very very important operator and this we will call b or rather this is an important operation on an operator this we call as an adjoint operator and what is an adjoint operator now sorry i put an extra e that was not intentional all right um now this is represented suppose you have an operator a okay the adjoint of operator a is represented as a please note this symbol okay this symbol here okay so it's a long line vertical line and a short line like that it is called a dagger okay so all of you i don't know whether you use with this terminology it's a knife okay a dagger is a knife all right so this looks like a knife okay it's a short knife or rather it's a short sword all right yeah it's a long knife or short sword so it's called a dagger so you will call it as a dagger all right so a dagger would mean the adjoint of a and what is this adjoint of a all right so this adjoint of a is essentially if you have this a represented as a square matrix we all know that operators are represented as square matrices right then if you change rows to columns what is this operation it's a transpose operation additionally what do you do you change element to its complex conjugate so in other words you take a conjugate of the entire matrix you change its rows into columns you change the uh, <clears throat> element to its complex conjugate all right then you get essentially with these two things you will have changed a to a dagger okay so it is a transpose conjugate of an operator all right why do we even bother with this okay so let us ask ourselves 
so now left to understand this let us go on to uh, something else you remember an inner product we wrote it as psi phi correct yeah i'm going back not to the dirac bracket notation i'm going back to the simple notation we wrote it as psi phi like this right and what did this mean this essentially meant psi star phi d tau correct now we can we also did something else we called uh, for a uh, if you remember an expectation value right we said an expectation value is nothing but psi a psi any questions please any questions okay we wrote it like this if you remember of course if we assume that the psi is normalized then this can also be written as psi a psi correct so remember we can also write something like this okay we can write it as psi a phi we can do it with two different ones okay what would this be we should be nothing but psi star a phi d tau <clears throat> okay we need not have the psi and the psi same of course it will not be an expectation value but doesn't matter we can define things like this how would you write it in the dirac bracket notation in the dirac bracket notation you would write it as psi a phi there is a way of taking it further you can write it as psi a phi okay now what you could do is that if you have it like this this implies of course psi a phi okay it it is essentially this is the meaning of it i wouldn't say implies this is the meaning of it what would happen if i wrote it as psi a dagger phi okay what is this this actually would mean a psi phi okay so remember the dagger operates on the bra all right it is essentially you take so i should again go to another page i think or maybe i can have some space over here if you take this guy and you want to convert it to this sorry i am writing it wrong a psi basically what you need to have over here is this guy will go to the dagger okay so that dagger operation will come in over there all right so just try and wrap your heads around it we will go over more and more examples and i'm hoping it will become more clear all right so essentially if you have a phi which is written as a ma'am next page oh yeah sorry thank you very much ma'am um, next page ma yes yes i will do it thank you very much for reminding me because i really forgot okay i'm very sorry about that all right so let me start off again so essentially if you have something which is defined like this okay so you have an operation a being carried out on this ket psi to give you the phi ket okay and you want to now write down what is the equivalent bra vector of all these things to get the bra vector of this you will have to have bra vector psi a dagger okay so i hope this is kind of clear to you what is happening so this is what we mean by the adjoint of an operation okay now we are going to come to some very interesting things with respect to this let me just change my so before we do this we are going to again prove some relations okay or we want prove it i will just give it to you so certain relations with adjoint operation okay so what are these relations the first one is that suppose you have an operator which is being multiplied by some scalar number okay 
so you just put in a constant over there okay and i want to take the adjoint of this what is this going to be equal to of course it is going to be equal to a dagger right but you will find that it is being multiplied by c star why does that happen c over here of course means that you are multiplying every element in a with c right so obviously when you do a transpose that is you change the rows into columns and change every element into its complex conjugate you will end up getting a c star multiplying everything okay i hope this relation is evident then if you do a plus b two operators and you take the dagger operation of them you will get essentially a dagger plus b dagger okay this i think is a kind of a it's a trivial relation okay it's not so very complicated but this one is a bit complicated i would say but i think you've again seen this with respect to matrices so it should not surprise you if you do ab the product dagger you will essentially get b dagger a dagger okay yeah so this is how it works right now very interesting is how we can redefine hermitian operators using this concept of adjoint okay how do we do it all right and i will just tell you over here if you remember hermitian operators how did we define them we defined them that if you had some phi a psi which will be equal to a phi psi okay then essentially you would say that a is hermitian okay now using this idea of the adjoint okay you can write a is hermitian means that a is equal equal to a dagger right so this is for us the new definition of hermitian in other words in general okay if you had let us say um psi sorry i'm not writing it right okay psi a phi okay this would be the same as a dagger psi phi okay this is always true but if you now find somebody wants i'll just admit somebody yeah but if you now find that your psi a phi is equal to a psi phi then remember that a is hermitian and this will be only possible if a is equal is the same as a dagger right so this is very 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 important right uh, the new definition of hermeticity we have learned a lot of definitions of hermeticity but this is one of the most crisp ways of putting it what do i mean by crisp just put it in you know there's just this short little uh, expression here and you have already said that a is hermitian okay a is equal to its adjoint all right that is hermitian all right so apart from this operator we'll go ahead and explain another operator and that is what we call as a unitary operator this is a very very important operator i'm going to change page over here okay so this is another very important operator as i said it's called a unitary operator and i'm going to be dealing a lot with unitary operators they are extremely important and you will realize why okay so these are unitary operators and what is a unitary operator a unitary operator is one okay so you say so unitary operators you represent with this u all right and what is a unitary operator a unitary operator is one that u dagger okay what is that the adjoint of u is the same as u inverse okay what does that mean it means that if you did u u dagger what will you get 
you will get an identity operator or you could have equivalently done u dagger u okay how do you get this simply you just do u u dagger take the dagger right is equal to i dagger but i dagger is anyway i okay nothing really changes an identity operator change its try doing it change the rows and columns of an identity operator and take the complex conjugate of every element you realize that an identity operator will not change correct what about on the left hand side from the rules that we got this will be equal to u dagger dagger u dagger which will be what u dagger dagger is nothing but u okay it's like doing a reversion an inverse and then an inverse of an inverse and then you get u dagger which will be again oh i have ended up with the same expression fine doesn't matter we will <laughs> we will attend to this later i think i have got the same expression haven't i yeah i have okay so it didn't work out sorry about that you will find that i do this a lot okay in class it is correct the expression but i haven't you know essentially taken you to this right so i will think about it and i will try and give it to you in some class when i have actually come to this conclusion all right so these are unitary operators and please remember they are extremely important okay why because of the simple reason that we are going to use them to do a kind of a coordinate transformation all right uh, we will attend to that later but please keep these unitary operators in your mind also i remember i have tried to tell you why adjoints are very very important okay now let us uh, move on what's the time okay almost one more of time all right so let us move on to the next concept there are a whole bunch of in between concepts which i think are not really essential for us but we will now move on to something very important which is that we were going to now learn a little more about commuting observables okay and why is it again let me try and tell you why is it important that we bother about commutations because again as far as measurements are concerned okay it is important for us to know whether making one measurement will affect the measurement i make later does the order in which i make the measurements actually matter so for instance you know that in the case of position and momentum whether i try to measure the position first or whether i try to measure the momentum first actually matters because it completely changes the value of the second measurement so if i had tried to measure position first and then momentum and if i try to measure momentum first and then position the values of the two positions i get may be completely different from each other right that's what uncertainty principle tells me now what i'm trying to tell you now is that there is a very strong connection with whether the operators linked with those dynamic variables commute or they don't commute okay so we will now learn a little more on uh commuting observables okay so what i will say is that we are going to learn a little bit more on commuting observables okay so now to do this let us imagine that we have two observables okay so we don't now we are not just talking about one observable once again when i say observable to you please remember what it means it's of course an operator <clears throat> it's a linear operator it's a hermitian operator if it is a hermitian operator remember it is equal to its adjoint it, all its eigen values are real and its eigen functions form an orthonormal set additionally we are calling it an observable which means that set of eigen functions are complete yeah what does it complete mean that you pick up any wave function defining any dynamical state of the system that means you're picking up a wave function from the vector space and that can be written 
as a linear combination of these eigenfunctions. Then that set of eigenfunctions is complete. All right. So we have two such observables. Okay. So let A and B be two observables. Okay. So let it be two observables. All right. Now let us imagine that you have a set of psi i's. Okay. So I'm writing a set of eigenkets. And what are these? These are complete. You know what complete means? That you pick up any wave function belonging to the uh, vector space. You can write it as a linear combination of these psi i's. Right? Now, and it is such that this is simultaneously eigenfunctions. If you want, you can also write it as eigenkets. Okay, no problems. Eigenkets of A and B. Okay, so here comes a new addition to the whole thing. Not only are these psi i's eigenfunctions of A, they are also eigenfunctions of B. In other words, A and B share a common set of eigenfunctions. Is this clear? Has everybody understood this? I will explain it a bit more. It means that if I do A on, let us say, this psi i, it will follow an eigen equation. So it will be equal to some a i psi i. Right? If I do b operating on psi i, this will also follow an eigen equation. And this will be b i psi i. Where a i and b i are some scalar constants. They are some numbers. Is this clear to everybody? And this is true for every psi i. So we will say that A and B share a common set of eigenkets. Okay, so let us imagine a situation like that. That I've picked up two observables a and b, and they are such that eigenfunctions of a are also eigenfunctions of b. Eigenfunctions of b are also eigenfunctions of a. All right. In such a case, you will say that a and b are compatible. Okay. You say they are compatible. This is just a new term. Okay. Don't worry about it. So if I say A and B are compatible, what does it mean? It essentially means that if I pick up an eigenket of A, it is definitely an eigenket of B. If I pick up an eigenket of B, it is definitely an eigenket of A. In other words, A and B have a common set of eigenkets. So what's the big deal about it? The big deal about it is if A and B are compute compatible, then A and B also commute. Okay, this is the important thing. There is a strong link between compatibility and commuting. So, if they share a common set of eigenkets, then A B commutator is equal to zero. This is what I need to prove to you. All right. I will need to prove to you that if A and B have a common set of eigenfunctions, or in other words, A and B are compatible, then A and B also commute. Okay, so let me just put it in the next page. So if you can give me two minutes, I will just show you the proof because it's a fairly easy proof. The converse is not so easy, but that is also true. So what we have to do is essentially show Okay, that 
compatible observables commute okay compatible observables commute all right so let me just quickly do this proof for you all right so a and b are two compatible observables okay now what does that mean remember every eigen ket of a is also an eigen ket of b so let psi i b and eigen ket okay obviously we know that since these two are compatible psi i is an eigen ket of both a and b then we know that a psi i is going to be some a i psi i we also know that b psi i is going to be equal to b i psi i what do we need to prove to prove that a b is equal to b a right this is what we need to prove so let us start off with doing a b acting on psi i this is nothing but a acting on b psi i what is this this b psi i between the brackets it's going to be nothing but b i psi i right this is from this equation this now we can write it as the b i will come out because it's just a number b i into a psi i right what is this a psi i in the brackets it is nothing but a i psi i okay this now can be written as b i a i psi i but what are b i and a i they are just numbers right so they are equivalent to a i b i right so i can just change the order so there i can write a b acting on psi i can be also written as a i b i psi i now that through the reverse thing we will put this a i into b psi i what is this in the brackets i have a b i psi i this number b i into psi i i can write this as capital b psi i right which is from here this relation again now this is just a number this a i i can take it inside so i'll do that so i can write this as b a i psi i but what is this a i psi i inside the bracket it is nothing from this equation on top okay it is nothing but b into a psi i so this thereby i can write it as equal to b a acting on psi i but you may say that ma'am this psi i is just an eigen ket so maybe this is only true for the eigen kets let us now think about any wave function phi belonging to the vector space we know that a and b are observables right thereby their set of eigen kets must be complete so i should be able to write this as summation over i ci psi i right let us now take ab operating on this phi this will be ab operating on summation over i ci psi i which is equal to summation over i ci psi ab operating on psi i which will be equal to summation over i ci 
बी ए ऑपरेटिंग ऑन साई आई टी आई होप दैट इज क्लियर टू एवरीबडी आई डोट नाउ लेट सी इफ आई कैन डू दिस लास्ट लाइन वेदर यू कैन सी इट दिस इम्प्लाइज ओके दैट ए बी एक्टिंग ऑन फाइव is equivalent to and from this step over here i will write it as i will take that ba out and inside i will get summation over i ci psi i which is equal to ba acting on phi okay i will just go to the next page i will end soon i'm sorry i'm taking up a little more time so let me just change the page over here this implies that for every phi belonging to the vector space i can write ab acting on phi is the same as ba acting on phi this implies that ab operation is absolutely the same as the ba operation okay which implies that ab a comma b commutator must be equal to c okay so if you do a uh, basically from here you can say that ab minus ba must be equal to 0 or in other words ab commutator is equal to 0 so what have we proved that if two observables have a common set of eigen kets then they commute okay and if they have to common set of eigen kets i can just go back to the earlier page please note i can measure a i can also measure the dynamic variable linked to b okay if there are eigen kets and i can do it for every dynamical state of the system all right so in other words i am suggesting that i can do simultaneous measurements if they commute but i need to prove the converse that if they commute then they have a common set of eigen kets which we will take up in the next class all right so i will stop the share here sorry for taking a little extra time but then a lot of people did come in a bit late and i see i have a lot of dropouts also do i okay yeah i think some two people have disappeared doesn't matter yeah so uh yeah so any doubts please any doubts okay uh please please look up these things if you have any doubts please ask okay we will clarify them before we start the next class and in between if you want to whatsapp me if you want to write up things if you you know if you have doubts please i will take time out and clarify them for you okay yeah because as i said my job is to make you learn all right okay so with this i will stop the lecture here i will wish you you all